Today's video should be of interest not just to classic golf enthusiasts, but to all golfers, as it tells the early history of one of the greatest irons ever designed. The Dunlop Maxfly Australian Blade story is a difficult one to tell. Its beginnings aren't well documented or even certain, and the fact that the clubs were produced for many years, with several variations, and across the world at different Dunlop plants, complicates things even further by giving us lots of slight variations on the designs. In this video, I'm going to concentrate on the earliest clubs and how these evolved to become the Australian blades that we all know and love. Lee Trevino's name is often mentioned in that story, and I'll attempt to put that into perspective. The first clubs in this evolutionary tale weren't called Australian Blades, and they weren't even by Dunlop. Our story begins with Slazinger in Australia in the late 1960s. At this time in Australia, there was a high tariff on many imported goods, and for golf clubs it was almost 50%, making imported clubs very expensive. This drove the home manufacturing market, and golf club making flourished. During this period, Slazinger Australia were producing some of the best irons in the world in my opinion, very good designs and very good quality. This was in part due to a man named Sandy Fakeney. Sandy Fakeney had served his apprenticeship at the large and innovative William Gibson Company in Scotland, learning the secrets of club design and manufacture. In 1948 he travelled to Australia and began working for Slazinger, where he quickly rose to become one of their foremost club designers. We can see his name on this specification sheet from 1964, approving the design of the Jack Nicholas Champion of the World irons. Sandy soon became known among the Australian golf professionals, and his clubs and skills and expertise were in high demand. During this time, Flasinger's forgings were produced at the Lithgow Small Arms Factory. The rough forgings would then be shipped just over 100 miles to Slazinger's factory in Alexandria, Sydney, where they would be ground into the final shape. This allowed for the clubs to be tailored to the exact requirements of the better players and professionals. This method was also being used by many of the big American manufacturers, except that they used carbon steel rather than the stainless steel that was being used by Slazinger. But more accurate drop forgings and castings were starting to appear, and the days of hand grinding for volume production were numbered. There were a number of iron heads from around this time that have such a likeness to the Australian blade that was to follow that they must be considered as predecessors. This link was first identified by Australian golf club maker and club collector Ross Baker, to whom I'm indebted for much of the information in this video. Thanks Ross. I've put a link to his Facebook page here and in the video description below. Three of those iron heads are shown here, and the muscle back style of them is identical to the later Australian blade. Actual dates for the clubs are uncertain, and from around 1968 to 1974 is the general consensus. Now would be a good time to discuss Trevino's involvement in the story, but first I need to mention David Graham who was himself a renowned club builder and designer with a solid reputation among his fellow professionals who would often bring their clubs to David for repairs or tweaking. David had begun his apprenticeship in the days when club professionals were able to take a wooden blank and turn it into a finished golf club and he also spent some time working for Precision Golf Forging or PGF, another top Australian club maker. In 1969, on a visit to Australia, Lee Trevino was admiring the irons that David Graham was using. David recommended that Lee go and speak to a great club maker called Sandy Fakeney. At the time, David Graham was sponsored by Dunlop, but Dunlop owned Slazinger, so it's reasonable to think that his clubs may have been built for him by Sandy Fakeney. Lee goes on to tell in an article that appeared in Golf Digest how he followed David's advice and found a disconsolate Sandy sitting in his workshop smoking a cigarette and surrounded by barrels of iron club heads. He says that Sandy gestured towards the barrels. My work has been reduced to rubbish, he cried. I'm a craftsman. I spent my life making these club heads by hand and now nobody sees any value in them. They're forging club heads by the hundreds now and these fine club heads I've made, they're seen as rubbish. Lee felt otherwise and began rummaging through the barrels and pulling out club heads. 
he'd stick a shaft in one and set it on the ground and see how it sat and how it felt. Eventually he built up a whole set and Sandy then assembled them for him. Whether or not the irons were all from the same model or a mix of models, we don't know, but the clubs were perfect for Lee. He went on to use them to win the US Open at Merion, his Open victories at Birkdale and Muirfield and his two PGA titles. Lee says that in later years, when he wasn't playing too well, he, he drilled some weight out of the heads and they were never the same again. He says he still has the clubs and could cry whenever he looks at them. So, if anyone knows how to contact Lee, he might be able to give the definitive answer as to what model they actually are, rather than the fuzzy guesses I'll be making shortly. But what does all this have to do with Australian blades, I hear you ask? We've already identified that Slazinger had at least three models that were Australian blades in all but name. We know that Lee got his clubs from Sandy Fakeney, and that Sandy worked for Slazinger, so it's fair to draw the conclusion that the iron heads would be by Slazinger. Is there any proof of this though? The short answer is no. I've done a lot of internet searching for pictures of Lee's irons at this time and unfortunately there are very few and what there, what there are, the picture quality leaves a lot to be desired. The following pictures are the best I've been able to find. First is a picture of Trevino's bag in the 1971 Open at Birkdale. He was using his own Green Tree branded bag at the time. Zooming in, we can see that the irons are a muscle-back style that matches that of the Slazinger clubs we've looked at. The second picture is from the 1972 Open at Muirfield. Zooming in, and again the best we can see, is a muscle-back style that might be what we're looking for. Finally, we have Lee's bag from the 1972 Piccadilly match play. Zooming in again, we see the same Australian blade style muscle on the toe profile, but also a fragment of a logo on the back of one club. Could it be a golden bear, as per the Slazinger Jack Nicholas Power Zoned Iron, or maybe the big S? If you squint, it could even be a sombrero. Did Lee get a sombrero stamped onto them? Or is this a set of his own green tree clubs? Admittedly, I probably want to see these things, so I'm a little biased. What do you think? Please comment below. I'm getting a little away from the facts here, so now would be a good time to talk about the missing link referred to in the video thumbnail. In 1971, Lee Trevino became associated with a company called Green Tree Golf. He may even have bought a share in the company. Green Tree were part of International Golf Holdings Limited, formerly known as Scotcraft. The new equipment article from Golf World magazine, April 1971, shown here, discusses two new models designed by Lee Trevino and introduced by Green Tree Golf. The basic Accurus range and the more expensive Signature range, the clubs Lee Trevino will play in the UK. It will be understandable that if Lee was going to use these clubs, that he'd have modelled them on the clubs he was using at the time, such an amazing success in competition, i.e. the Sandy Fakeney Slazinger irons. Next, from Golf World's July 1972 edition, comes this advert for Green Tree, where four models are now offered. The personal model, made to the master's own design, the Accurist, the Signature, and the Sombrero. It's odd that the first article appears to claim that the Signature model is the leading club, but this advert now has the Signature as one of the lesser clubs. Maybe they decided on a renaming for the personal model, which does have Lee's signature on it after all. We'll be taking a look at the Green Tree personal model irons shortly and comparing them against an Australian blade and one of those early Slazinger irons to see just how alike they are. The Green Tree irons have no part in the actual Slazinger or Dunlop lineage, as Green Tree were an independent manufacturer with no links to Dunlop that I'm aware of. And in any event, the company folded in 1978, just as the Australian blade story proper was starting. They do, however, offer strong support to the argument that the irons Lee Trevino acquired from Sandy Fakeney were indeed one of the Slazinger Australian blade predecessors that we've looked at. Before we take a closer look at the Green Tree Club, I just need to add in the last piece of the trail leading us to the Australian blade. And that is the Dunlop Maxfly Made in Australia model that came out around 1976. What caused the shift away from Slazinger and renaming Dunlop Maxfly I don't know, 
perhaps the stronger worldwide profile of the Dunlop Max Fly brand? But in any event, this model is a clear forerunner of the first Australian blade model as shown here. As the name quite clearly tells us, this model was made in Australia, but its qualities soon became appreciated around the world. The Australian blade soon followed, and production spread across the globe. OK, time to look at some clubs. First I'll do a review of the clubs in the usual way, and then I'll compare the Lutrovino personal model with the early Australian blade and the early Slazinger model that I believe is a predecessor of the Australian blade. An interesting set today. Woods and irons are the same uh, model and they are produced by a company uh, that was set up in Scotland with the Lee Trevino name. Exactly what his involvement was I'm not 100% sure. Uh, the company is Green Tree Golf Limited, Scotland. Uh, they were in Dunbar. Uh, this tree logo for Green Tree. You can see there we've got the one wood. Um, it's a laminated face. This one has a, a, a two colour insert, black, with a, a sort of a clearish gold edge, which gives it an attractive finish. And on the top, we can see the model, Lee Trevino, personal model. Nice bit of whipping with a, a ferrule as well. I just see the top of the ferrule there in red and gold. And here we've got the one wood, and we've also got the three wood. I'm not sure what you would call the colour. Um, sort of an olive brown or something like that. Uh, the shaft on these is Contralite Regular Flex and then we've got Litorino signature there and the personal model name Green Tree Golf Scotland Regular Flex. Oh, that's the, the two woods. And here are the irons. Again it's the Litorino personal model. We've got a nice sombrero there. One of Lee's trademarks again. Um, I've got the three to sand wedge uh, in this set. Here I'm showing the three, five, seven pitching wedge and sand wedge. So if we start with the three iron, then um, if we look at the profile, anybody familiar with Australian blades will recognise this profile. Um, it's a, a sort of a muscle back profile um, with that thin top line. Um, on the Australian blades ones, it would say Max Fly there. And Australian blade along the bottom in most of the models anyway. You can see that it's a pinned head. Uh, around the, the hosel we've got handmade in Scotland. Nice ferrule, black with a white and red um, band and a thin gold bead there. Again we've got the Contralite shaft in there, regular flex and the grips on these are in much better condition. They're pro only um, Golf Pride again, the pitching wedge and the sand wedge, very similar uh, apart from the fact that they're slightly different on the profile and they are again very similar to the profiles of the pitching wedge and sand wedge in the Australian blade sets. Right, and that's the irons quickly re reviewed, well, one other part that I forgot to mention, um, we've got a nice feature there. Um, boxing in the grooves, we've got a row of sombreros, at least that's what I assume they are. They certainly look like miniature sombreros. Oh, and green tree on the bottom. And here's the putter that I'm going to be using. Green tree did make putters, but I don't have one, so I'm going to be using this one. I've featured it before BG Bronte Golf, um, and it's the Silver Knight model made in England. Okay now the interesting bit comparing these to the Australian blade and one thing I'd like to say uh, at the start here is that this model uh, was released in 1972 which is very early in the Australian blade story. Uh, I don't think a club marked Australian blade appeared until maybe 1976, 77, 78. But let's have a look at this one and We'll compare it with uh, what I call the 1978 model as sold in the UK, which is uh, Max Fly in bl block uh, capitals, Australian blade with a black dot roundel. Um, so put them side by side 
and it's very obvious that they're very similar clubs. If I measure the uh, the head length, they're very similar again. The sole profile tapered, uh, narrow at the heel, getting wider towards the end. Uh, the faces themselves, the actual groove part, pretty similar. The toes are slightly different. Uh, this one is more rounded, whereas the Maxfly one is more squared. Uh, hosel length, the uh, green tree one is quite a little bit longer. So, what else can we look at? I've looked at the I've looked at the toe profile. But, yeah, again, you can see very similar. Uh, the green tree on the left here, and the Maxfly on the right. So that's one comparison. As I said, the, the first uh, Marks Australian blade came out um, around 1976 or 78, but there were versions of that um, head that were produced as far back as the late 1960s, I think, and I believe that this is one of those. We can see straight away that it's got Slazinger on it. Dunlop acquired the Slazinger name. I think this was produced in Australia. The ferrule on it is typical of uh, ferrules used in Australia at the time. And I've never seen this model in the UK before. There is a version with a big S there, uh, which um, I know was an Australian one. If we look on the sole, it's a uh, ropey, this one. It's just got a number five on it. But again, we can clearly see the, the lineage uh, from this to this. Uh, and the Lee Trevino, date-wise, would fall somewhere in between. Well, that's nothing to do with Dunlop. Uh, Green Tree was owned by International Golf Holdings. Again, looking at the, the end profile, all three clubs very similar. The Slazinger, the Dunlop Max Fly and the Green Tree. If anything, the, uh, the Green Tree is more similar to this one. It has a wider uh, sole or a thicker sole, which would uh, suggest that this is the one that this is modelled on. This is the late 1960s version, which is the one that Lee Trevino would have had experience with. Just looking at the, the toe profiles, the Slazinger one is, is a higher toe, and I'd say again it's closer to the, the Dunlop Max Fly. So that's the, uh, the comparison of those three clubs. So Slazinger, Dunlop Max Fly, and the Lee Trevino. As I say, this is a cast head, cast stainless steel. Um, but it is quite soft. We can see there's a big dent in the bottom there. But I'm pretty sure that Lee Trevino um, would have modelled these irons on the set of irons that he got from the legendary Sandy Fakeney. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it enough to consider looking at some of the other videos on the channel. And I hope to see you next time.